And hey, everybody, this is um, uh, Monday, the 29th of April. So we're week five uh, Monday uh, class. And tonight I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll open with a few questions, but I do want to run through the slideshow that I sent everybody and uh, can certainly field any questions uh, as we go along. So how's everybody doing? Good. Everything good at your end, Daniel? Yeah, I'm, I'm good too. I'm sorry, I'm keeping it on mute because there's a few background noises going on here, but uh, I've been, uh, missed a few classes and I'm getting all caught up. So glad to be back with you guys. All right, back in the saddle again. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. And anything anybody needs me to, to cover or rehash or clarify before we dive in? Mm -hmm. All good. All right, then we are all good. And we are now sharing. So, um, yeah, I don't know what happened. You know, I think there's a limited amount of time that I can have my my class set up, I guess. So it it eliminated that class, and then I went and wait a minute, that's not the right number. So I had to use use my own link that you guys use to get in. All right, so we are uh, uh, diving uh, more deeply into the business of marketing and selling wines, and uh, that's going to be our focus uh, over the next um, four weeks until the end of class. Uh, and we've uh, been spending some time, and I, I don't want to uh, uh, drive this to death, but, uh, but the basic channels, uh, as they're, they're typically called, is, is how you get the product from your possession as a producer to the point of sale and to the consumer, uh, and that the the, the primary difference between marketing and sales is that in sales, a transaction takes place. Okay, marketing's all of the things uh, that about the product and about the brand, about the labeling. So the scope of marketing is very, very wide. It, it encompasses a, a lot of uh, different activities uh, versus primarily the sales is, is, is that transactional and, and then remember dependent upon the sales channel, <clears throat> there may be several intermediary or intermediate uh, sales that take place. So for example, direct to consumer is typically the most clear. You make the product, you sell it to the consumer. Uh, direct to account is you make the product, you hold a wholesale license in your state, you sell it to accounts that are, are licensed, uh, but you become the distributor. You don't eliminate the distributor, you become the distributor. And uh, Rachel, by the way, this is, it's really great to lock in each, each one of these processes right. and, and then to compare and contrast them <laughs> uh, with different, different models in different countries. Um, internet reseller is, is either a pass through that the, an internet site is, is taking on marketing of your wines in addition to everything that, that you do with the marketing of your wines and then they collect either a pass-through fee and just turn you know it, an internet reseller may may not uh, take any physical possession of the goods or they may take possession physical possession of the goods now one of the interesting things to to note in the different models in that are constantly changing and <clears throat> and uh, uh, that whole landscape is gets kind of crazy if if I'm an internet reseller who takes possession of of the goods it gives me a stronger negotiating position but then I'm taking on risk I'm <clears throat> outlaying money 
Uh, so, so also think that for an internet reseller, um, you've got this negotiating uh, uh, position to to negotiate what your ultimate cost is going to be. Plus, any time that a transaction is taking place where legal, you've also got to carefully consider what are the terms. Uh, I actually just got a um, a, a a consulting request through through some some things that that I kind of market myself through and and it was actually uh, a consulting gig for a large uh, an international uh, uh, wine brand that you all would recognize and they're running into real problems with their accounts receivable okay meaning they're selling the wines to distributors to importers in different countries uh, and, and through the various channels and they're not getting paid. <laughs> so, uh, so many times uh, it, it, it's worthwhile to go through and, and look at kind of these different models of, of how people are, are doing their internet reselling. Does that, that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. And then, of course, the three-tier system, which is the largest volume opportunity that comes with all sorts of, of challenges. Uh, it's easy to find a lot of people that hate the dominance of the three-tier system. And on, on, in many, many cases, the, the, uh, the complaints and the anger are, are very well-directed but also make sure to understand the value of the three-tier system because you're actually, you're, you're selling the product and, and moving it out of your warehouse. Now it becomes, an, you know, you've got account receivables and you've got terms that you'll usually have with a distributor, but they've got a, they've got dedicated sales team. Uh, they, they often have some of the most highly uh, wine knowledgeable and uh, people in the industry. They also uh, have the, the facilities. They, they now take on the risk of selling to the restaurants and the retailers and to that accounts receivable you know, portion of things. If you're selling direct to account, you'll, you'll learn really quickly now that you've got to do the billing to the restaurants and hotels that you sell to, they are no notoriously uh, 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 bad in terms of paying uh, within the scope of agreed upon terms. So let's say that you've got uh, terms and you're selling direct to account uh, to a restaurant. <clears throat> you've worked really hard to make that placement. <laughs> then sometimes you've got to work even harder to get your money. Uh, and, and of course, uh, Restaurants are a very high turnover proposition. Also, they go out of business, so you can you can count that, you know, write that down as a loss. So the three tier system also has people that go in and stock the wines. They go in and do the inventory. They um, they set up displays. Uh, a lot of times they'll have an, a department where they'll do the display materials, the little point of sale signage and, and uh, uh, things that you see when you go into a store. Um, the larger distributors have an entire dedicated division just to do wine lists. And they control the wine lists. And uh, uh, so, so, Picking and choosing your distributors is just a real critical part of things. Then, of, of course, export becomes any combination of things because you're selling into another country. Now, you could establish yourself as the importer. So whether it's wines in China or the UK or Italian wines being sold in the United States, you can be a producer exporting to a holding company or an entity in the destination market. You could be selling export to a, uh, a broker 
or to a a, uh, a licensed importer that brings in, in the goods and then distributes them to distributors throughout the country. Uh, every distributor that I know of holds an import license. So whether it's Southern Wine and Spirits or a, 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 a boutique a small distributor out of Oakland or something like that, uh, uh, distributors have that ability to hold the license so if they find a, a small winery in the Rhone or a really great you know ice wine from Canada or an Australian wine they will also be able to bring those wines in directly into their into their um, into the into their their warehouse in whatever state and then distribute it okay so a lot of different ways that these businesses can be done all right uh beyond marketing wine it's also important to look at how is a region marketing itself how how is as as a bigger entity uh, uh danielle or uh, rachel and i talked a lot about what is a brand and what is a brand from a traditional consumer packaged goods perspective uh, was one example that we were discussing. But then there's also, if you look at the etymology of the word brand and so forth, one could easily argue, depending on how you define the word brand, that Napa Valley is a brand. I'm looking for a Napa Cabernet. Now, if Napa is something that's indelibly etched into the mind's eye of the consumer as something of value, something associated with, with a product, then as an umbrella, Napa could be argued as a brand. Uh, and that's why you will find uh, the U.S. has a U.S. marketing entity for wine. Uh, there's Wines and Foods of France, or Sopexa, uh, for French wines. There are Wines and Foods of, of Spain. So at a country level, you'll actually see the marketing. And, and again, one could argue if it's marketed and, and it's something that's protected and it's something then that you're trying to build that, that link in, in the mind's eye of the consumer, then it could be defined as a brand. Does that make sense to you, Rachel? Mm -hmm. So, so what, what, here's what's interesting. Uh, this was a recent, uh, well, this, this article is a couple years old, and, I, and I, I use this slide because you go to uh, Sonoma Square, and it used to be this really great hardware store and cafes and all these hippy-dippy boutiques and whatever, but just like St. Helena, just like a lot of towns in Australia, in, in France, and certainly in Italy, uh, as the brand image and awareness increases, so does the cost of, of real estate. So does the cost of operating a storefront. And so slowly but surely, all of the 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 sort of local stores and barber shops are all gone and uh tasting rooms are emerging so that people can get a local inn or a hotel or b and b or airbnb or whatever walk over to the square and you've got 30 different tasting rooms to choose from and each one of these is is trying to differentiate differentiate itself from the others uh, and it it's also playing to they probably have a tasting room at the winery and then they open a remote tasting room so so you can have a tasting room where the people go okay now what's happening along this front when you start to get this total reshaping of the landscape of the businesses I, uh, when i joined behringer in 1988 i moved out and i needed a haircut and i went to saint helena 
and you could you could go over to um, oh god I can't remember the, there, there's a cafe there that's a, a fancy restaurant now and you could you could go in at breakfast and you're eating your breakfast and the place is filled with people drinking beer at at six o'clock in the morning and it's like holy moly these people have a problem but no it was actually night shift from all the wineries coming to to have dinner right. <laughs> and have a beer because they're on their way home and uh and that was always fun because it was also a great place to sit around and bs with people and even network for jobs there were winemakers there and and it was really cool so i go over to this barber shop and and it was uh the old style, you know, antique barber chairs, just two of them. And the barber just looked a little weird. His, he had really, really thick glasses and, and heavy, heavy cataracts. You know, his eyes were, were really. So I, I came in, he said, have a seat. And so I sat down. He said, how can I help you? I said, well, I want a little trim and this, this and that. And he said, I'm sorry, you'll have to go somewhere else. And I said, well, why? He said, I only do buzz cuts. I said, you only do buzz cuts? He said, yes, I'm blind. <laughs> it was a blind barber. Wow. And it was so cool. That <laughs> a lot of people like me lament this. Um, the place that, that's there now, you can go in and buy a, a $200 pair of socks. All right. and and it's this, this, this whole you know, generation of success, and, and success all, also comes with its own new set of, of issues and problems to the point that none of the other businesses can actually survive and the pressure to open more tasting rooms. So this is a fairly recent article uh, talking about the downtown is now trying to limit the number of tasting rooms and tighten the reins, just like more and more areas are try trying to actually eliminate vineyard growth and development. And the ag preserves, whether it's in Tuscany or whether it's outside of Sydney or whether it's anywhere around the, the Bay Area, uh, the, the wine interests are trying to protect their vineyards. Uh, the biggest example of this was in Windsor, California, which is in Sonoma, up Highway 101. And the land value for, for development was way greater than it was for vineyards. And so this has been pressure in Napa, but it also puts... Um, puts a, a, a limitations on ability for normal people to go in with reasonable amounts of money, start a, start a vineyard and, um, and operate, okay? So, um, so a brand being a type of product manufactured by a particular company under a particular name. Okay, so that would be, that would actually then uh, eliminate Napa as a brand under an argument if you were to, to utilize that definition. But then if you look at the etymology and identifying Mark burned on livestock or whatever, or criminals, um, uh, again, if one could argue that Napa Valley is a brand, and even in a way, Chardonnay is a brand, uh, but it wouldn't be under this definition or the, the, the conversation that Rachel and I had about somebody giving her a, a definition, okay? Uh, now, a market is the, the place where the, the point, of, point of sale basically it used to be, you know, areas within or outside of a castle, or in a town and you go to the market and that's where people bring the things to be uh, uh, bought and sold. And certainly the, I, the idea of, of, of a market 
can be huge, the global market for wine, let's say. Uh, certainly the French or the U.S. market or you know, UK, China. So, so markets can be thought of, of in a modern sense as concentral, uh, uh, concentric circles very, very general to highly specific of where transactions take place. Because you have markets like Publix or Kroger or Safeway, you have Total Wines and More is a market. Uh, and that's actually in the more, more traditional sense uh, that then working out of the, that individual place where the transaction happens, well, you know, you've got the Atlanta market or the London market, et cetera, okay? So, so uh, uh, and of course, now we've got the, the virtual market and the internet market. And then the act of marketing, the definition of marketing is the action of or business of promoting and selling the products and services, including market research and advertising, all right? So, so kind of, and, and we're going to expand on that, actually, because uh, when I got to Behringer, I had no clue how involved the marketing department was in everything from vineyard forecasting through production, uh, uh, certainly all the, the normal things, you know, the design and the graphics and the advertising and all that kind of stuff. But, but even then after the follow-up and the, the uh, uh, doing the market research, going in and surveying different markets, meaning going into a, a city and seeing where your product is, what the competition is, where you're positioned versus the competition and so forth. <laughs> So back to uh, Marketing 101, which are the four Ps. It's a product, a price, a place, and then the promotion of the wine, okay? Uh, as we've talked about playing then the game, who cares? Identifying a market, who are you marketing to? And, and it's very easy to jump straight to the, the actual consumer transaction to think, oh, that's the market. Uh, but then ultimately you'll learn you may have to sell to and then through a gatekeeper to get your products to that market. Uh, if you're doing consumer direct, then you're dealing with the actual purchaser and, and the engagement at the point of purchase, whether it's a tasting room, whether it's a remote tasting room, so on-site tasting room, remote tasting room, or through internet. But there's also something coming up that are pop-up direct-to-consumer things. And um, so there are wineries where you can do this and have it licensed that we will be in blah, blah market or this area. Uh, even sometimes it could be a, a, a farmer's market that a winery is, has procured a, a, a space, a stall or, or, or whatever it is, and where legal, and there's a lot of restrictions to this, you, you can actually have this remote tasting room kind of a concept, all right? Uh, and so, so marketing fundamentally is, is finding what do people care about and then how can I reach out to them and make them aware of my product? How can I convert them into a customer? And that means a transaction takes place. And then how can I keep them as long as possible as a customer and so so for for a strong brand uh to sustain over time and and to have the best growth potential it's the customer retention and that brand loyalty that is king uh, uh, 
Rachel, have you ever read the, uh, the, the, the book on marketing and Harley Davidson? Mm-mm. Um, you wouldn't know the name of that, would you, Daniel? Sorry. Oh, that, that's all right. I'm trying to remember. There's, there's a book called like Zen and the Harley David, Davidson and Zen or something. I'll see if I can find it, Rachel, or you, you could probably Google and find it on Amazon. But it, it, it's a really great case study of how do you create a brand, in this case, Harley Davidson, where people are so passionate about the product that they'll, they want it tattooed on their body. <laughs> right. I've got a picture uh, uh, when I was in Florida last year, I was in Naples at a wine shop doing a book signing and some stuff like that. And, and one of the, uh, there was a young guy working there, um, uh, good looking, smart, wanted to be in the wine industry, is working in the wine store to, to gain his knowledge. And, uh, and he had Sangiovese tattooed on his neck. <laughs> All right. Now, the other thing is, it's, it's harder and harder to differentiate. And as I'm going to talk about, one of the things that, that's happening in the wine industry, and, it's, and it start, seems to be kind of ramping up, uh, and that is bashing the market to positively position your products. Uh, this is a friend of mine, Tom Work. He's um, uh, one of the best marketers and marketing consultants. He's got a daily blog that's really worthwhile reading and uh, about, you know, wine PR. Um, and you know, here's a company that's that's claiming your twenty dollar bottle actually is worth three dollars, and our five dollar wines are better than you than your fifty dollar wines, and and they make a lot of assertions and a lot of math, and 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 frankly, they're just not telling the truth. Um, they are they're actually their their marketing campaign is causing a very serious image issue, negative image, image issue within the wine trade. Now, will, will that have any effect on their customers? That's the open-ended question. Uh, there was an, another recent, it's been actually going around uh, from Vine Pair, did a thing about what's in your, what's in Two Buck Chuck. And it's insinuating that there's frogs in there and that, that it's crap and the wines are no good and you're a horrible person if you like them because you're stupid. And, and it's like, what the hell are you doing? How, how, is, how is that helping the wine industry in any way, shape, or form? It, it's almost like you know fake news generated by the beer industry to help people not drink wine and not trust the wine industry. So, so it's really interesting also to, to see the dynamics. Uh, you know, again, the cat doesn't care. You're, you're, you're trying to sell to a gatekeeper. That's your actual, the consumer is not the purchaser. The cat doesn't care. It can be just a lump of brown stuff on the floor. All right, so then as you look, through each channel option and each touch point of, of where the, the product goes, if you're the producer and you're selling to a, a distributor and or an importer in another country, you've got to be able to provide a sound business plan, a sound rationale for your product. It will include your marketing materials, your label, your positioning, your ratings, your awards, and so forth. But most of all, they care how, how are you going to help me sell this wine? And it could be that uh, like Costa Brown, they were really struggling. They were about to go out of business. 
they got the Wine Spectator Wine of the Year Award and, and everything just exploded. But their sales were based on a mailing list, not even a wine club, and we'll talk about cellar door and, and mailing list sales um, versus a tasting room or a wine club. And, and so they, they were able to, 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 to frankly hit the lottery. Now, if you don't have the lottery and you're trying to get maybe just in your own state with, with distributors or you wanna go into select markets, you really have to be aware of what does it take, what do they care about, so that you can go in, present a marketing plan, a sales plan, pricing, and tell them this is how selling our wine will, will uh, positively affect your business. This is our, our business and value proposition for you, okay? And then also, now you've gotten it to the distributor, they're fundamentally taking over a lot of the, the work, but you, you very typically still need to go, go to restaurants, work with hotel chains, uh, go into the stores and talk with the, the people in the stores, all right? So you're the producer, You've got to find out what the distributor cares about and as much as possible then provide their sales force and their sales management with as much in the way of incentives and tools to go out and sell your wine. But it's also highly desirable to them to know you're going to come into the market or have somebody in the market and this is giving rise to, uh, to brand ambassadors, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, brand ambassadors are sometimes paid, sometimes not. Maybe they just love your wine. Maybe you can get on their mailing list because you're, you're a brand ambassador. Uh, maybe they just, where legal again, provide you with free wine for, for doing things. I ran into, I just emailed her today. Where's her card? Oh my goodness. Hang on a second. Ah, there you go. Cat Dykes. So I, I went to up to Washington State, uh, to Richland, Washington to do a, a, a I, was, I was a guest of honor for a fundraising luncheon. And, um, and so I went up there and I checked into my, uh, my hotel right on the gorge on the you know, Columbia River really gorgeous and uh, I arrived on a Friday evening and somebody said oh and you can go over for the wine tasting uh, which is typical in so many places all around the world to have a little you know and it might be concierge level or whatever so I went over just to see what was going on and I met Kat Dykes she runs a she, she's built a company called VineWineCraftBar.com. And basically, she is a remote tasting room and acts as a brand ambassador for, for a number of wineries in Washington. And the hotel has turned over the happy hour to Cat. And so you can go over, have a free glass of wine. The hotel loves this because they don't have to do it. They don't have to pay somebody. They don't have to give away free wine. She's selling the wine. She's got an order sheet there and, and, and whatever. And she's doing this as a, a business. She's created a business for herself. And it was really cool. I told her, I'm going to share you with my class. So she, how does she get paid? Like a percentage of the sale? Yeah. So, so she's acting as probably more like a broker for the wineries. They may or may not pay her a, a retainer or something like that. But she, she gets a percentage of the sales then that she, she generates for the winery. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't, doesn't have to put up any capital or risk or whatever. So she's a brand ambassador 
And tonight we're featuring wines from these two wineries. We've got a couple whites, a couple reds. And, and it's also promoting, here, try these wines if you love them. Let me give you the directions because if, if you're going to go out and visit some wineries. So she's also helping to, the, to market the tasting room and, and the winery. It was just so cool. Now, here's the other cool thing. I said, what do you do? What the hell do you do with the rest of your time? She goes, I, I go around to hotels and restaurants and stores promoting these brands also. So during the day, that's she's working as a, a broker, salesperson, ambassador. And then she gets a percentage of any sales she makes there. She does this thing on Friday nights at the lodge. And she's got a, a, a website and a following or a, a, an email list, I think it is. And then she'll let you know uh, over the weekend, uh, she'll do two pop-up tastings somewhere around the area at a restaurant or a store. And then she'll email, I'm going to be here, come taste the new releases. We're featuring this wine and this and that. So she's got a following. And she does these pop-up tastings. So congratulations, Cat Dykes. That is entrepreneurship. All right. So here's what I didn't know about marketing when when <clears throat> when when I joined Behringer and moved from Atlanta to uh, to the Napa Valley. Marketing covers the wine. There's the wine regions. There's promotional organizations also. So uh, the marketing of, of, of wine in a wine region is one thing, uh, but then there's also promotional organizations for people who, who group together like Zinfandel Advocates and Producers, ZAP. They have this huge event every year in, in San Francisco, now I think at the Presidio and draws thousands and thousands of passionate Zinfandel lovers. And it's a, a, a whole weekend of events and tastings and that kind of stuff. But also remember, everybody that's got a product or a service is marketing what they do also. So uh, there's accounting products and services, legal, online content and media service, online retail services, wine education. I've got to market this class. Um, events have to market themselves. Uh, distributors are marketing themselves. A distributor wants to be the best service provider possible to gain uh, the trust and the relationships with the restaurants, with the, the stores that it services. So they need to market and, and they're not doing that necessarily overtly, but it's, it's a very, very uh, uh, strong. So, so for example, if I'm a distributor that has a service of will create and, and manage and print your wine list, all right. First of all, you've got to look carefully at, at, at the legal ramifications of, pro, of, of providing something of value. But if, if I can own the wine lists, and, and so much focus is put on uh, restaurants and so forth that tend to have um, sommeliers and a wine director and so forth, they, they re you really think beyond how... How, who's managing the restaurants in these B level or, or, or lower tier properties, you know, restaurants and chains and, and so forth. So, uh, and, and so many of them just are, are happy to turn it over to, uh, to somebody else to manage. Now, usually how that'll work is, is that the distributor who owns the wine list will also give assurances. We'll, you know, we'll make sure, that if there's any brands that you really want on on your list that we don't carry, we'll we'll get those on. So it's a it's a real careful dance that has to be done uh, uh, to manage that. But 
but incredible marketing value of a service to the restaurants to be able to do something like that. Okay. Then of course you got to market. You, if if you have a sales outlet, a store, a restaurant, wine bar, you got to market those tasting rooms, wine clubs, etc. And so so the way some of this is looking is uh, th this uh, this is fresh news. I think maybe even from today or um, yeah from the 29th. So when you see these events, you can also think, wow, who's behind this? Uh, uh, see if you can follow the money, uh, whether it's the South Beach Wine Festival, whether it's the Wine Spectator, you know, experience. Um, and, and here's the Oregon Wineries Association uh, stepping into, okay, we're marketing Oregon. We're going to go to uh, um, to Portland. Uh, we open this to our members. So also as marketing expenses, you've got to look at things like memberships into organizations such as the Oregon Wine Growers Association, the California Wine Institute, the Napa Valley Vintners at ad nauseum, and then are you going to spend marketing dollars to support these kind of programs? Because sometimes these can be really expensive. Um, uh, look at the, if the Napa Valley barrel auction is a marketing event, all right? And it's, a, it, it's, it's very costly to participate. And especially since it's a fundraising, think about the economies you're now going to have auctioned off a barrel of your wine and if you're only making you know a few hundred or a few thousand cases and then behind the scenes what's going on with the Napa Valley wine auction and these really high high-end things is also people are trying to have relationships with very wealthy people to bid on my lot and so that's a really really big game and that's why you see these, you know, absolutely astronomical sums of money being paid because it's marketing and, and needs to be understood. And so what they do then is they see who else can we get that if we're marketing Oregon, how can we defray some of these expenses, All right? Tillamook cheese, chocolates, provisions, the raspberry and blackberry, uh, and hazelnuts and pears and whatever, all right? So these can be very complex. Uh, and, and again, think about these as, as business ventures uh, uh, when you see them. And if you had a winery, what would be compelling enough for you to provide the, the wine, to pay the fees for participation, for participating in the organization in the first place, and then going and giving away product. And then having, how do you get the product there? You know, who's pouring the wines? How's that being managed and so forth? Are those, um, are those usually nonprofit organizations? Very often they are. Now, uh, uh, in Oregon, uh, uh, there's the, the Oregon Wine Growers Association, which is a for-profit uh, uh, but offers marketing services and, and so forth. And then there's the Oregon Wine Board, which is a 501c3, which is the nonprofit. Right. And, and that's, that's with, because of it's a 501c3, it's, it's got an education mandate. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And so on and so forth. So anyways, that's, that's kind of, kind of fun to take a look at in, in a different light, all right? All right, so, so again, there's, you know, in, in, the, in the, the value chain, in the supply chain, it's one step after another. Uh, and when, if, if the sales and marketing of the Napa Valley is successful, the price of grapes goes up. As the price of grapes goes up, the price of land goes up. As the price of land goes up, then the the the, the rent for your uh, 
downtown tasting room goes up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it then becomes this vicious cycle and, and really, really works into the question sometimes, what is the difference between a $10 bottle of wine and a $100 bottle of wine? Um, roles and responsibilities are all the way from forecasting along with sales. What are going to be our volumes? What's, you know, how much, how much are, are we, we able to sell and how much are we able to produce? And how do we be able to accurately forecast for the demand so that we can achieve our sales quotas and, and keep our inventories turning? Um, so this goes, uh, so then you've got also product design, labeling and branding and the brand management kind of, of end of things, which is basically what I used to think was, a, was what marketing did. Uh, develop and implement the promotional tactics, a wide, wide range of, of, of activities and holidays. I was in a, uh, a, a grocery store, I wish I had turned my phone on. Uh, it was almost a fist fight over a space for a holiday display and there were two mer merchandising people who worked for the marketing department and, and the sales department and they were, they were literally screaming at each other. No, this is my space. Get your goddamn wines off of here. And, and it was hysterical. They were having a real estate dispute. So um, number four is where I, where really, really, a, you know, it, whether it's a single person doing everything or whether it's a highly sophisticated organization, you know, it's, it's, it's a cycle almost. You, how many tons do you need for a wine is dependent on the wine volumes uh, that you need and the forecasting of that. Then making sure you've got your packaging materials, your bottles, your boxes, your capsules and corks or screw caps or glass stoppers or whatever it is. Uh, the labels are, are designed and printed and that all the information's correct so that at the winery everything comes together. So it's the, the production schedules and, and whatever are, can, can be really uh, quite a dance trying to line everything up together and have it all converge at the right time in the right place. And then, and then when are, are you bottling you know what's the production schedule so that you've got product whether it's you know a few months turnaround for a moscato or a white zin or a, even a pinot grigio or is it years out for special reserve wines and and that kind of stuff and then just dis distribution logistics are are all part of the marketing supply chain these these are most often coordinated by marketing, which I didn't know. Uh, pricing by marketing, you know, and, and if are, are you going to try to have a national price, meaning each state you're going to make little adjustments for taxes and shipping costs and those kind of things. Uh, discounts and posts, post offs. Now for anybody who doesn't know the term post off, many states require that if you're going to discount a controlled substance like wine, that you need to uh, apply or, or notify the state that you are offering a special discount and that that discount needs to be posted 30 days in advance so that all the restaurants, all the uh, uh, retail stores have advance notice that this discounting's coming up, and then everybody has an equal chance to get their inventory straight to get ready for a sale and so on. So that's what post offs are. And when you get into control states or uh, uh, different control markets, uh, everybody, you know, it, it's really hard for the retailers or the stores to have a competitive advantage. Uh, I'm doing some work with some uh, company in Alberta, Canada, 
And basically everybody gets the same exact pricing regardless of volume. And then when the post off is given, everybody's got the same exact things on sale. So it's, it's, it, it can be really a, a messy kind of a thing. Then of course you got all the, uh, you've got to design, produce and distribute crummers and corkscrews and t-shirts and baseball caps and posters and signage and back cards and you know our, our our best burger or our you know summer grilling or our holiday displays and so forth uh, you've got to have then your advertising in your ad calorie or calendar and then most often marketing is also doing public relations. Now public relations versus marketing is typically where you're getting, you're working to get an independent or at least a third party to write about your wines, all right? So a distinction between, and, and uh, when I was hired by Behringer, I was actually director of, of uh, public relations and communications, uh, and it was, in the construct of Behringer, now Treasury Wine Estates at the time, it was its own separate department, worked closely with marketing, worked closely with sales, but we were separate from. And, uh, and my boss was Tor Kenward, who has the famous Tor wines now. Uh, in other companies, PR is just simply a subdivision of, of the marketing division. All right. So different ways. And this is going around, taking the winemaker out, meeting with people, having press come to your winery, do special events and so forth. So you can get that that article in USA Today or your local newspaper or something where somebody else is saying great things about your wine, hopefully. Would you also in that category, would you count like sending bottles out to be to like wine spectator that that was that was uh, in in it at Behringer, that was our, our responsibility yeah so anything that had to do with the press that was not uh market related basically kind of fell under pr and so even even the participation in like or uh, you know napa valley vintners it, it, that was my responsibility i went around and did the dog and pony shows and the tours and that kind of stuff uh my job was to take ed sabraja to new york we would set up to meet with you know have lunch with this writer you know host this tasting in the afternoon uh do a special dinner at an account and this is where where there was this really close uh inner relationship I would talk to the salespeople. I would talk with marketing. I would then, you know, we would determine, you know, where we want to be, who we want to hit, how we want to get there, that kind of stuff. All right. So I'm going to be sending out tonight uh, a business plan. You got four weeks to work on this. Uh, it's just a simple template. And uh, your final, uh, uh, project to complete this course. First project's a $25 red blend cost of sales. Second project is, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about this as we go because, uh, uh, but it'll be a, a, a cost of sales workbook and the business plan template that you'll have filled out. You can do a case study, you can do this a number of ways. This could be your wine from your winery, or the wine you want to make from the winery you want to open or whatever. A lot of flexibility in here, but there's going to be a, a plan in defining your marketing uh, strategies. And you're going to be asked to look at what's, what's the macro environment of the wine industry. And right now, a lot of things are, are, are cooking um, with, with some things indicating that this, this global growth is is maybe, maybe leveling off, the, the grape market's a little bit unstable, uh, the imports and tariffs from the U.S. to China are meaning that a lot of wine, it's not a huge, huge amount for the U.S. because we suck at export, 
because we don't necessarily need it. But there's there are inventories that are building up and accounts receivable that that wineries are getting stuck for for cash flow uh, because the imports uh, duties and tariffs for China. Uh, where does that wine go? So a lot of people think they're in, insulated. Well, we're just a little winery. We don't care so much about that. But but that's a really naive way to go into the wine business, no matter how small you are. And you know, uh, so we'll be talking about you know the the current environment, creating personas. We'll be talking about that a lot. And and how do you define? the scope of a market, if you make a Chardonnay, <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a lot of, a lot of products out there you're competing with at a lot of prices. So how do you kind of narrow in? And then we're also going to find, uh, it's really frustrating trying to get accurate and up-to-date sales data on stuff. So we'll be talking about that as well. Okay and defining needs and we're going to start transitioning from critical thinking to doing a SWOT analysis and uh, uh, so we'll we'll do a little bit more of that and uh, Rachel did we have the SWOT analysis as a way to to formulate papers right? yeah yeah Excellent. all right and then kind of kind of to wrap this up again don't don't think that just because you're you're selling direct to consumer that that all of a sudden you're pure profit and you're scot free. Um, if if you if you have a tasting room, you've you've got a mortgage or rent or something that you're paying for. You've got utilities. You've got cash registers and internet and point of sale. You've got breakerage and pilferage and you need glassware and so forth so so we'll be going through each of these channels also looking what what are the the actual costs that are incurred through the channel because if again if you if you've got the tasting or you've got to market it you've got to be in the guides you've got to figure out a way to get people to that tasting room and what does that do to the profit margin potential what kind of volume can you do uh, through each of the channels, and and if, if if you're looking at significant levels of production, you're going to have to look beyond a tasting room and even a wine club. And then, what kind of additional sales supports required through each of these sales channels? Okay. So as we've discussed, that's it. And uh, just Tim, quick, quick question. Yes. This is for you, and, and maybe Rachel too, since she's been doing a lot of research. Have, have you guys seen anything innovative uh, in the way of wine clubs? Because to me, from what I've seen, they're all basically the same. They're all kind of, you know, the silver, bronze, platinum program, uh, once, twice, twice a year. Is there anything different that you're seeing that has a, maybe a better hook for people? Uh, so, so, so quickly, I'm going to say put that onto the Facebook page. Okay. And then let's start. And, and that's what the that's perfect for the Facebook page because I will there are dozens of clubs doing the exact same things all proclaiming we're personalizing this or we've got this or we're using artificial intelligence so so this will be a, a, a fun thing to 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 explore Rachel and anything come to mind for you um I mean, I'm thinking about like Scribe and Sonoma, like you get invitations to like special parties at the winery that are just for wine club members, but like they're, you know, they'll have like, they're not just like a party, they'll have like music there. It's something, it's like an event you really would want to go to, but you can only go if you're a wine club member. Yeah, and, 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 and there's hundreds of wine clubs doing that. Yeah. So the VIP status, it's what's that inducement to, to convert somebody to join the wine club and and it's trending now one of one of the most uh uh significant uh developments in in winery tasting rooms on yelp is people complaining about quit quit asking me to join the wine club get off my freaking back i'm i'm not coming back to your winery just because of the pressure 
because everybody's got an incentive to get, to sign you up. And, um, and so, so it will be going through this and we've actually got a, a whole workbook on the tasting room uh, pro forma that makes a really great, I'll go through that uh, uh, coming up to show line by line uh, the kind of things people are looking to do to differentiate themselves to offer something of value, the VIP, the, you know, uh, uh, partnership, you know, join our wine club, you get a 10% off at this local restaurant or, or whatever. Okay, and I got a part three to that question, but I'll put it on the Facebook, okay? Yeah, go ahead and go ahead and throw it out real quickly so we can well, part B is um, is starting the club without having a tasting room. Oh yeah, that's that's the new game. You know, uh, 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 radio stations, hotels, uh, and and so forth, uh, non-producer wine clubs. <laughs> it's all sorts of stuff. Wine shop at home, you know, the Tupperware of wine. I love wine shop at home, but basically they're multi-level marketing model. Uh, now they do have a winery, but when they started, they didn't. They were they were doing their own brands, custom crushing and, and bulk. Uh, uh, they come into your home and they have people, they've got over 2,000 people around the country that are, are uh, their there are consultants that come in, in, you know, you, you, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll set up so you can host a tasting of their wines in your home with your friends and stuff. It's, it's really kind of cool. Okay. Okay. So let's go through this. I think we're about out of time and, uh, uh, let's take it to the, uh, discussion forums and we'll be diving into this for the next couple weeks. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, everybody, thanks so much. Bye. All right, bye-bye.